David Benjamin. I'm your host and the founder of HealthyWildAndFree.com. If you're like me, you understand that health, the mind, body, spirit, heart connection, and living a green, eco-friendly, sustainable lifestyle are some of the most valuable and life-enhancing lessons that we can learn and pass on to our children to live happy and abundant lives. That's why this podcast was created, to help you grow in these areas. If you aren't already subscribed to the newsletter, go to HealthyWildAndFree.com, click the box at the top right-hand corner to get a free copy of our latest ebook, and you'll be subscribed to be notified about future podcasts. Thanks for subscribing and tuning in. Enjoy. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Benjamin from HealthyWildAndFree.com, and today we have a very... A very special, unique guest who's going to be talking about um, brain, the brain health and its connection to, um, well, fitness rather, and its connection to brain health, and uh, how we can use that to our advantage to basically um, improve our health, improve our brain function, and just uh, uh, live longer lives um, with with better memory, really. So. Um, let me see if I can get him on the line real quick, and then, um, okay, here we go. All right, so first I'm going to introduce him. His name is John Rady. He's an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and he's the author of eight books, including his latest book, Spark, The New Science of Exercise and the Brain. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Let me see if I can get him in real quick. And uh, Hello, John. Are you there? Hello. 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 Good to be with you this morning. Hey, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. I really, uh, really enjoyed your book. Um, uh, you know, Spark the new exor- the new science of exercise in the brain, and uh, I'm really excited about this interview. Um, I kind of wanted to start the interview off in a different kind of fashion, and just to ask you, um, how did you get into kind of uh, fitness and the brain, and, and kind of uh, the link between these two in the first place, like what sparked your interest in that way? <laughs> yes, uh, I'll tell you. What sparked my interest was uh, actually growing up uh, here in Boston uh, uh, from a, a training point of view. I, I spent my years in the 70s here. Um, I started in the 70s and never left. But uh, and that was when the Boston Marathon was exploding, uh, and uh, we learned a lot about what exercise, or we thought, uh, what exercise was doing uh, to make people be able to run through Heartbreak Hill and up the up up the hill at the very end, and and be able to reach that Nirvana type state. So it became very, we became very addicted to. Uh, our own uh, endorphins, and that was the idea that we all had these great endorphins that uh, we we raised when we were in this endurance phase that led to a, a non-depressed, uh, fully satiated, fully ready to go, being able to push through pain kind of state. And uh, so, because we had just discovered the brain, if you will, and discovering a lot about it uh, in the 70s and then in the 80s, and then we learned that perhaps endorphins wasn't the whole story, but there were a lot of other things going on to make our uh, uh, mood different, to change the way we felt about things. Um, And uh, this led to a lifelong interest in how exercise could uh, change our mood, change our, and then change our attention uh, system. I began to see a bunch of people from the marathon who were who had to stop because of uh, an injury to their leg or their ankle or to their back and hip, uh, and uh, these people came in and immediately they were all depressed. Um, uh, but after they worked through that, a number of very, very high-functioning people had uh, what we'd call adult attention deficit disorder, and this led to another uh, sort of uh, area that my expertise, interest, and, and passion, which was attention deficit disorder, uh, and the fact that uh, exercise was 
always something that we recommended and that people had been using as a way of uh, dealing with their ADD. They were self-medicating uh, these people that had been very high performers and had been marathoners and all of a sudden they had to stop and they couldn't train or, or run uh, and they appeared with symptoms that they never had before which were really uh, classic attention deficit disorder symptoms. Mm -hmm. So basically the I mean, we're really just feeling great kind of being more alert aware and, and having that uh, rush of endorphins was kind of a kind of the the buzz at the time, if you will. Um, you, you talked about in your book briefly about the, the Naperville School District and how students' test scores increased and, and, and different things occurred when they implemented an exercise program. Can you share with yeah. our audience? What, sure. What? No. I, I, well, here's here's the real uh, background. I, I I was always interested in exercise and and written a whole. Uh, books on a, a attention deficit disorder and then was researching a book on uh, which later became a user's guide to the brain and always uh, emphasizing that exercise was the most powerful effect, natural effect that we had on our brains. And, uh, and I had outlined uh, a book on exercise and mental health in the mid-90s and never got around to it because I was doing so many other things. Uh, but then I learned about this school in Naperville in 2003 and learned that uh, uh, of their 19,000 students in their school district, only 3% of them were overweight. And uh, of their 7,500 kids in their two high schools, they didn't have an obese child. Um, so this was compelling. Uh, because what the, what had happened 20 years before that, one of their PE teachers, Bill Lawler, uh, noticed that even though he had his kids every day in middle school for physical education, his kids were not getting any healthier uh, because they were playing traditional games and sports and all that, and he was a very passionate a uh, baseball coach, but also a passionate physical educator, and he said, we have to do something different. And he began to revolutionize the program where it became a fitness-based program, uh, daily fitness uh, exercises, running, uh, calisthenics, but main focus on aerobic conditioning. And uh, then three years into this, he felt that his athletes were still getting the best grades, so he decided to make this brilliant step where he started having everybody wear uh, heart rate monitors. And this allowed him to grade on the amount of time the person spent in their cardiac training zone, which meant that the athletes had to work pretty hard and the unathletic kids and the uh, uh, people that had coordination problems or came in a little bit uh, heavy or out of shape they had to work uh, as just as hard as the athletes, uh, but their heart rates were in the cardiac training zone, uh, and everybody then could do well in physical education and get an A. Uh, this led to a huge change at his school, and then other schools in his district began to uh, switch and change uh, into this mode, and eventually all of the many schools that were in the district uh, adopted this program and that led to this incredible fit po student population and uh, some years before that uh, in 2001 they had uh, lobbied to take the TIMS test which is the international uh, science and math test that's given every three years uh, to most countries all over the world, and the U.S. was is usually in the mid to lower teens in scoring in science and math. Well, they took it as a country and came in number one in the world in science and number six in math. And this was 99% of their student body. So all the kids took it, and this was dramatic um, and got me on an airplane to visit Naperville to find out what was going on, and then uh, it was very clear after being there that 
I was going to also focus not just on the emotional regulation power of exercise, but also on promoting cognitive health, uh, cognitive performance, intellectual uh, capacity, etc. So that led to my beginning to put together uh, reading a thousand papers and trying to abstract them and make them readable, uh, which I think we did in Spark. Yeah, definitely. If, if, as far as the Naperville School District, was, was the fitness program the only thing enacted within the school district, or was there, was there a diet uh, component as well within the, within the school, or anything else, or was it just the fitness program? Well, I can tell you this quite honestly. In 2005, when I was, 2004, 2005, when I was there every year, uh, their cafeteria had not changed at all from the old uh, starch, and uh, they still had soda machines and, and uh, juice machines in the cafeteria. Kids were, you know, got pizza and pasta and all the other things that uh, has an effect on diet. Uh, and uh, it was just purely the fitness program, I think, that, that we can attribute this to. But what happens when you get fed is you get more interested in your diet, uh, more careful about your diet, which we know happens uh, psychologically, but also physiologically. We know that exercise chronically will make you less craving those quick carbohydrates, and uh, that's led to... Uh, it's a, a much more reasonable diet approach. Right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. It'd be interesting to to see a school uh, have a change in their diet program as well as the fitness program uh, holistically well, at the same time. They they did do that later on. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like most schools, they uh, or like a lot of schools, they did change their their whole cafeteria. They they became much more focused on wellness in general because they knew the power of this in terms of making their students better students so but it but at that time it had not the wave of change the jamie oliver stuff or the the you know the let's eat right kind of thing had not yet affected uh the schools like it has today so they did not change initially but then subsequently they they have changed quite uh, along with many other schools. Right. Yeah, I, I found that really interesting just because the um, the the changes that we're, we're seeing, you know, within uh, the, the fitness, uh, the, the obesity rates, um, the, men, the cognition, the perf, uh, test performance scores, and things like that were, I mean, remarkable, the, the, the change that occurred. So it was, inspi- it was inspiring to, to start the book in that way just because, it kind of prepared me as the reader for the book to, um, you know, really uh, immerse myself in the information and uh, have, a, have a better uh, inclination to uh, use the information and kind of really embrace it. So um, I really like that you started the book that way. Uh, you, t- you talked about a brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or otherwise known as BDNF, in the book. For listeners that, that aren't familiar with this, what exactly is BDNF and how does it impact our lives? Well, BDNF is is a factor that we learned about oh, maybe in the early 90s uh, or late 80s. It, we didn't know about it for, you know, but as we were di- discovering what was happening in the brain, we uh, this, this little factor was identified. It was initially thought just to guide the development of the brain from birth but then we began to realize that this factor was really what's what I called the fertilizer, brain fertilizer, or what I called miracle growth for the brain, uh, because this factor is is vital to have our brain cells grow, but also have our brain cells remain resistant to stress. And what we've learned subsequently is incredible what, what BDNF does. It, it keeps our brain cells, our 100 billion brain cells that we have, uh, regulated. It helps uh, make them young and perky.
silky. It does everything that fertilizer does. And the corollary to all this is that BDNF uh, promotes the growth of our nerve cells. And that is very important. In the last 15 years, there have been three Nobel Prizes given to people showing that the way we learn anything, the way we take in information, is with that we have to have our brain cells grow. So the BDNF is a key factor. Now we know there are many others, but it, it's sort of the mother uh, factor of keeping our brain cells ready to grow and sprout. And this is essential for us to encode information to put it in our uh, memory banks, and then also to retrieve it. Subsequent to, the, the, in this decade, in uh, the past 10, 15 years, we've learned that BDNF also is a regulator of mood. And in fact, many people now are thinking that the antidepressant effect of our drugs and of our activities and certainly of exercise is related to BDNF levels because one of the uh, gross changes that we see when people get depressed is that their brains become less plastic, which means less able to change and grow, and in fact erode in a chronic depressive state. So uh, by dumping in BDNF, we get uh, a change back 